Dave, how did you get interested in this Recode protocol for helping people reverse Alzheimer's dementia and cognitive decline? Well, I suppose my interest skyrocketed when we found ourselves caretaking my wife's grandmother who had dementia for a number of years and then, of course, ultimately died. <clears throat> During that time, <clears throat> Laura was heavily involved in her care, but I was there too. We were staying in grandma's home for a period of time. <clears throat> It's a terrible way to go. It's a very slow, grueling death. And watching that, of course, I had increasing questions about why is this happening? It also seemed like a number of people in my sphere, and I'm, and I'm a member of a church that's very interested in health. We have what we call the health message. And, and it was becoming painfully obvious to me that many of our people who are interested in health and trying to pursue a healthier way of life are getting the very same diseases and I was wanting to know why is this? And add to that the fact that, that Alzheimer's dementia, many now consider Alzheimer's to be the, the number three killer. It was number six for some time and it, it just, you can still find it on the list at number six. But the leading researchers are saying now it's number three. So that means heart disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's. And I have friends in, in my sphere that are getting these, so I'm, so I'm like, you know, what do we do? Well, <clears throat> I stumbled across a book called The End of Alzheimer's by a guy named Dale Bredesen, who's a UCLA professor, and he's been doing research for 30 plus years on Alzheimer's. And he started to have success reversing Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So it was very exciting because for me this was the first big breakthrough because I couldn't find anything that was promising. And then I found out that Dr. Bredesen was doing a clinical training for physicians and nurses and health professionals. So I called his company and I said I'd like to do this training. I'm not a doctor or a nurse or anything else but I'd like to do this training. Could, would, can I do it? And they said sure you can do it as a health coach. So <clears throat> I did it and that and that is just skyrocketed my interest even more. And, and I'll never forget, <clears throat> I had to live stream it because they sold out. It's a hot topic. And there were many, many other health professionals all over the US that were live streaming it with me. And at the very beginning, there was a Q&A panel early on in the session. And I'll never forget, they asked Dr. Bredesen, um, what's the response rate that you're seeing? So here's a doctor and a scientist with a lot of other doctors in the room. And they gotta be careful what they say, right? I mean, they're not, uh, are they gonna bamboozle all these science people and these medical people? And he said, it's 100%, 100% response rate. It doesn't mean that, that everyone has complete reversal, but there, is, there are results that everyone experiences. And, and that floored me, I thought, this is amazing. Yeah. So through the course of that <clears throat> training, uh, I, I learned about how Dr. Bredesen, other physicians that are working close to him, and many who are now applying his protocol, are having remarkable cases of reversal. We're talking about people who have uh, lost their verbal skills, people who've had to quit their jobs, people who can't drive anymore, being able to regain all those things. So I don't know if you ever saw a movie called Awakenings, but I mean, it's, it's almost like that. <clears throat> so to me, this is a very, very exciting development. I certainly would, am, am happy to encourage people to get the book, The End of Alzheimer's. If you, and particularly if you have Alzheimer's in your family, I, there, are, there are people who may see this interview and they themselves maybe have the early signs, which shouldn't be ignored, or they have a loved one. Those people are very motivated. But if you have a relative, if you have a close relative, grandma, whatever, died of Alzheimer's, you really should check this out. Dr. Bredesen says that they have not had a case where a person on the protocol went from, say, mild cognitive impairment, which is pre-Alzheimer's, into Alzheimer's.
not a single case. He believes that this can be headed off at the pass. The earlier you catch it, the better. So I would encourage people to read the book. The, the, the full protocol is in the book. The recommended lab work that a person should get is all in the book. And I think the book is written uh, in, in layman's terms. It's not something that's super scientific and hard for a person to follow. Yeah, so there's more than three, but there is, inflammatory is, for many people, you know, that's, that's the cause. And a lot of people have inflammation, sort of, if it's not out of control, it's headed there in their life. The, the thing about this approach is that Dr. Bredesen shares with you lab tests that you can get that will help you identify uh, what may be going on with you. So inflammatory is one type. Another type is trophic factors, which, which is just sort of a fancy way of saying you don't have the building blocks, you don't have the nutrients that you need. And your brain, we're fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible says. So the brain does something very interesting. If it's running out of resources, it figures out how to grab those things that it needs from somewhere else. And it, it starts to prioritize the available resources. And unfortunately, what ends up going first for many people is their memory. Because as long as you can keep breathing and eating and doing your basic functions of life, you can stay alive. And so it's really, it's a survival mechanism. And, that's, and so what's actually happening is in many cases, for those who have that type of Alzheimer's, they don't have the building blocks, they don't have the nutrients that they need. And the brain is continually having to rebuild synapses. And so some are getting torn down, some are getting built. The brain, is, the brain is trying to be efficient. And so it's saying, well, we need some more resources over here. Uh, let's see, where can we get them from? Where for sure we're not going to kill this body, but it, it starts to kind of triage. And so for many people it's that. For some people there's a glycotoxic variety of Alzheimer's, which some people call that diabetes type 3. So it's related to blood sugar. It's related to uh, diabetes. And you can start to recognize already that the, just the things I've mentioned, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that lifestyle changes could have a dramatic impact on a person's outcome. And what's to me very exciting about this approach, which I think, I certainly hope we're going to see more and more of, uh, for sure in the functional medicine world, is that there are metrics, there are ways that you can go about it. We're not just talking about throwing spaghetti at the wall to see if it'll stick. We're not just talking about dumping a bunch of supplements down your throat and hoping that one of them works. We're talking about actually testing to find what do we need, what's actually going on in the body, and then what can we do to address that. So, and then of course, I mean, another, another factor is toxicity. And, uh, you know, I don't think that we have to labor too much to convince people that we're in a toxic world. There is, I was reading recently that there's really no place on the planet that has not felt the effects of toxicity and pollution in our world. Because of the jet stream, it's just traveling everywhere. I read recently that 90% of us have plastic in our blood. So toxicity can play a huge role in this. And so there's a toxic variety and the approach for that is to try to identify the toxicity and get rid of it. And of course trauma. Trauma to the brain, trauma to the head can lead to Alzheimer's as well. And so there's things that can be done for that. So I think I probably just rattled through five. I don't know if there are more types than that that, that Bredesen and his team and others. And there's a lot of interesting research being done on this in various parts of the country, but uh, so far I'm the most excited with, with what Dr. Bredesen has done. And, and I think it's just last year, I think it was the fall of 2018, maybe you can look it up, but 
uh, a paper was released with 100 reversals, 100 cases of reversals that are documented. I think now they're working on 500 cases. And so this is a very, very exciting time. And something that when you realize how much fear surrounds Alzheimer's, and rightly so, because if a person could choose how they want to go, um, Alzheimer's is one of the worst ways. And, and so much so that, you know, Watson and Crick were the famous discoverers of the, the alpha helix in DNA, you know, that double-stranded helical structure. And I think it was Crick that uh, when, when the availability came to test the genome, he did not want to know his APOE4 status, which happens to be the gene that's the highest predictor of Alzheimer's. He didn't want to know. There was nothing that could be done. And it would only serve to depress him. And times have changed. Now, there's no reason not to know because it will give you that much more motivation to do something that will head it off at the pass. I don't think that you, could, you would necessarily say that a person with APOE4 positive is going to have to work harder or be more diligent. They should be more motivated. Because remember, there are multiple different types of Alzheimer's a person could get. Now, whether or not you have APOE4, you might, oh, there's a type I didn't mention, that's vascular. So vascular disease, maybe no surprise, right? Because it's going to impact circulation. Vascular disease, there's, so there's a vascular dimen, uh, dimension to dementia. There's a tongue twister. Um, so <clears throat> depending on the type of Alzheimer's you have, APOE4 may not have to be a player. Maybe you have toxicity. But if you're APOE4 positive, from what I understand in the research, you are 50 to 90 percent more likely to develop Alzheimer's in your life. So that's a huge, huge motivator. And as I mentioned, Dr. Bredesen is saying that they've had such great success at, at heading it off at the pass and that they haven't seen a case, based on what I've read, that has passed from MCI, which is mild cognitive impairment, uh, into Alzheimer's for a person who's been following his protocol. These people are highly motivated. That's what impressed me the most. They got their life back. And it takes a, f a high degree of motivation because it's, a, it's an involved protocol. It involves, you know, once you have the testing, it involves supplementation. It may involve a whole regime of detoxification. It involves dietary changes. Uh, Dr. Bredesen and his team have had a lot of great results with a more of a keto type of a diet. He calls it keto flex. And, and I should have a qualifier here because keto has become a garbage pail term and <clears throat> it's very popular for losing weight. So keto means all kinds of things to, to uh, people out there. So it's very specific. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it to for people to read the book to find out more about the specificity. But I will say this, it can be done entirely plant-based. And there are plenty of people out there that are, that are pursuing this kind of a diet, completely plant-based. And I did it myself. After I did the training, I wanted to, one of the best ways for me to learn is to, after I learn, is to teach someone else. So I got a group together to teach a class. <clears throat> and I promised them that for 30 days, I would do the keto flex diet myself. I haven't been having any cognitive impairment, so I wasn't motivated to do it longer than that. But partly I wanted to demonstrate that it could be done. It could be done and get the, po the kind of blood results you want to see, <clears throat> showing that indeed I was in nutritional ketosis and that it could be done entirely plant-based. So I want to encourage people out there who are interested in doing that. But I, and I will say this. You'll see in Dr. Bredesen's book that he's not promoting plant-based per se. You don't have to be plant-based. But he himself is, what he is promoting is predominantly plant-based. He's really kind of down on dairy. And if you're going to eat meat, he's got some very strict requirements on the kind and source of meat and the amount of meat. Because without going into great detail about what it means to be in nutritional ketosis, essentially you, you change your metabolism. So you're no longer burning glucose, you're burning ketones. And the problem is if you eat too much protein, <clears throat> your body has a backdoor method of turning that into 
sugar, turning it into glucose. So that's one of the reasons why following the Keto Flex diet is largely plant-based anyway. So it, it is, it, it's an involved protocol. And so it did impress me that these people are highly motivated. There are people who are not as, they're finding that they do not have to be as rigorous to get the results. So this kind of goes back to the question you asked, like does a person with APOE4 have to be more rigorous or work harder? Whether or not you have to work harder at it or be more rigorous has to do with whatever it takes to get the results. And having said all this, this, this is a challenge because it is a lifestyle approach. Um, Dr. Bredesen calls it a programmatics approach. That means that for many people, if they don't have a person to help them do it, it's probably unrealistic. And another challenge, which is just the nature of the beast here, is that as a person, as a person's cognition declines, it can be more and more difficult to convey to them or for them to really understand, comprehend, whatever, the urgency of the matter of changing to get their life back. And so for some people, they find that it's too much of a battle. It's too hard for the caregivers sometimes. It might be a spouse. Uh, I talked to a man who, it, when it came right down to it, he said to me, it's just too much a fight and I really don't want our marriage to have this level of animosity because his wife had slipped to the point where she couldn't recognize herself, mm. the value of doing this, and she was very resistant mm. to the protocol, to the lifestyle changes, to the diet. And so it's very sad when that happens, which makes again for this argument that the earlier the better, if a person can, can catch this. And it's interesting, you know, Dr. Bredesen recommends that anyone who is 45 or older, if they haven't, they should do a cognoscopy is what he calls it, which is just a, uh, it's sort of a broad array of tests, including that genetic test for the APOE4 gene. Um, and, you know, he likens it to a colonoscopy. People, in, at least in the United States here, are pretty familiar now when you turn 50, you know, your insurance company will give you a colonoscopy as a birthday present. So it's the same kind of an idea, but it kind of sets a baseline for you. It helps you to find out what risk factors might be there. And it's not too early to start turning the ship around the other direction before you get there. So there's an idea about what's commonly called intermittent fasting, and I suppose there are probably some varying definitions of that as well. But there's an advantage to limiting the eating window to approximately an eight-hour window during a 24-hour period. So the reason that there's some benefit to that is because when you start approaching 12, 14, 16 hours from the last meal, your metabolism is starting to shift toward ketosis anyway. And one of the advantages, there's a number of reasons why it's believed that nutritional ketosis can be helpful for cognitive decline. One of them is because it seems to stimulate BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which we talked a little while ago about trophic factors, things that your brain needs to, to rebuild. And that's one of them. And that stimulates this kind of rebuilding. And so, and, and incidentally, nutritional ketosis, ketosis isn't the only thing that does that. Exercise does that too. Exercise all by itself will increase the production of BDNF. And exercise is an important part of Dr. Bredesen's protocol too. A lot of this is, a lot of these are things that many of us have, have heard about, but this is kind of all put together in a way that helps us understand why uh, that, that that would help with cognitive decline. So you're right, the, the eating window or the times of day. So a person should think about, you know, how their schedule is, whether it's their work schedule or whatever, and 
How could they strategically plan their meals to fit within an eight, maybe nine hour at the most window? Typically we think of an eight hour window though, so that you can have that 12 to 14 to even 16 hour break in between from the last meal of the day to the first meal of the next day and you can get that benefit. I've been doing that myself. In fact, I started doing that before I even learned about Bredesen and Alzheimer's and everything else. I did it because I was trying to lose some extra pounds and I heard that that was a good way to do it. I got hooked primarily because of how great I felt at the end of that 12 to 16 hour fasting window. And so the more, it made my mornings much, much more productive hmm. because I wasn't feeling bogged down with food. And a lot, there are many people I think say to themselves, I could never do that. I didn't think I could do that. I thought that would not work. It didn't take me very long. It was just, you know, it did take a while to get used to it, but not very long before I was not just okay with it. I was hooked. So that is an important factor. This is one thing that Dr. Bredesen really got my attention on. The fact that we need to pay attention to those little signs that, you know, we call senior moments or brain freeze or whatever, we kind of joke about it. If we start to notice those increasing in frequency that we shouldn't take it lightly. The point here isn't to like terrify people that you're getting Alzheimer's. The point is to take it seriously because this is how you catch things early and head it off at the pass. And, and of, uh, of all the diseases out there, this one really does seem to have such remarkable response to these kind of lifestyle changes that I don't think anybody should be afraid of it. So Paying attention to that stuff is good. There's a direct correlation to homocysteine levels and cognitive problems. And so why not do that? For many people, when they, when they see the list of tests and they realize, man, this is two or 3,000 bucks, you know, I can't afford it. Can I just do the protocol? Yeah, of course you can just do the protocol. You can do that. It's, it's not as fine-tuned and smart an approach because, you know, you want to also be able to do some follow-up testing and see, is, or the, the supplementation that I'm taking, is it working? Is it changing things? Do I need to try something different? So without testing, you don't know that. But, but a person could do that. But if you were just to select, if you could only afford a few tests, I don't know why a person wouldn't do a homocysteine test because of a correlation that's seen there. Vitamin D. You know, and incidentally, I should, I should mention this, you know, you can order your own tests, life extension. And I say they're, they're not that expensive. I guess that's a relative term. For some people, it, might, it, it, it may seem expensive. I can tell you that life extension is a whole lot cheaper than just going down to whatever lab. And, and, and typically, they contract with Quest Labs, which are in many, many places around the country. There's also walk-in lab. Walk-in lab has comparable prices, maybe not quite as good sometimes as life extension. And I should also mention, we can put a link under this video for a whole package that a company that Dr. Bredesen started will do all the testing for you. And I know that the first thought a person has is, well, there's a conflict of interest there. Okay, well, whatever. But I've checked the prices and it's very, very competitive to get a full package of all the tests that he would recommend kind of for the first pass. I think that, that this, at the time of this recording, I think that maybe the total cost of that might be around a thousand bucks or something, but it's far cheaper than going out and piecemealing it all yourself if you wanted to do all the tests. Plus, you're going to get a report back that's going to tell you on a weighted scale where it appears that most of your problems are coming from. Is it predominantly inflammation? Is it more trophic factors? You know, what is it? So <clears throat> that would be, uh, so I, I mentioned homocysteine, vitamin D. If, if we want to talk about the protocol itself, for sure, exercise, sleep. There's a study out of Harvard that very dramatically shows the power of simply making sure you get to seven, eight hours of sleep a night, every night. 
and many, many people are sleep deprived. Maybe they don't even think of themselves as sleep deprived, but many people aren't getting that much sleep. And then, of course, the whole diet, which, and I would also say this, I think it is prudent and advisable to find a health professional that you can work with as you go through this process. For sure, do not stop your current medical treatment without seeking some advice. And it doesn't mean that you can't change what you're doing. You can, but, but it's very individual. And I should say this about the, the Keto Flex diet too, that there are individualized factors that should be taken into account so that people need to be apprised. Are some people at greater risk for having a heart event by increasing their fat intake, which a keto diet does? They are. Are there ways to address that, to minimize those risks? There are. Some of it falls into the category of the APOE4 tests we were talking about. It turns out that those people, from what I've read, have a higher likelihood of having their LDL particle number go through the roof with coconut oil, whereas people without that genetic factor may not. So it's important that people be aware of that because there, there can be some deleterious effects by following this without some sort of guidance and some sort of help because you could be going down a path and having some things happen. But having said that, there is a lot of misunderstanding about a keto type of a diet out there. There's a lot of fear surrounding it. Some of it, perhaps rightly so, because it's become such a craze and such a popularized thing to do that you can just go online and find some you know, keto diet plan and maybe it's garbage that has uh, no... Uh, attention given to what the sources of that fat are or anything else. But I will say this, that after doing it for 30 days, I had my blood tested at the beginning, I had my blood tested at the end, I had heart labs done, and I had excellent heart labs after 30 days of being on a keto diet. I had just as good heart labs as virtually as I had when I did the CHIP program, which was a low, low fat. And so I recognize that this is probably the most controversial part of the whole protocol. But I want to address something because, you know, a lot of the thinking of low fat, no fat, and how that's better for your heart comes from the Framingham study, which tells us that Nobody with a total cholesterol under 150 had a heart attack. But what I learned more recently is that what I was not told about the Framingham study is that it also showed that with cholesterol below 150, cognition went down. If most people had to choose between Alzheimer's and a heart attack, I think I know what many people would choose. I know what I would choose. <laughs> but I don't think you have to choose between the two it is possible to follow this. And Dr. Bredesen has patients, people that he's worked with, who've been able to maintain very, very good heart labs. But it is individual. We all respond a bit differently to a program like this. And so it's extremely useful to find. And I think, fair to say, critical that a person find someone who can help them sort through this. You need to find a health prof professional who can help you. If your doctor doesn't want to do it, you know, that's fine. Find someone who will. I, I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you, if you, you either have a loved one who's facing this or you recognize this is starting to happen to you, please get on this. What I mean by get on this is get on this issue. You, read it for yourself. Do your own research. All the things I've talked about here are available to everyone. You can find this information online. And be encouraged that you can 
see reversal. You can turn this ship around. If a person is greatly advanced, are they going to see the same results as, person who, as a person who started early? Most likely not. I have, I have seen some uh, cases of in, incredible reversals that should be an, a great encouragement to anyone. But for sure, the sooner you get on it, the better. There's really no, there's no upside to not doing this, and I can't see a downside. Anything else you'd like to add? Not that I can think of right now. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dave, for sharing us with us about the Dale Bredesen's Recode Protocol. Thanks for the opportunity, and I uh, appreciate this chance to chat with you about it, Glenn, and again, um, just hoping that people will take advantage of this information. It's a very, very exciting time, so uh, people can take heart.